on today's webinar where we're going to be sharing with you the results from our survey of employers and hiring managers in the IT sector across Canada. Um, so as Caitlin rightly pointed out there, my name is Ron O'Grady, I'm President of Hayes in Canada and I've worked in the specialist recruitment industry for almost 20 years now, all with Hayes um, and nine of those, I'm coming up to half, half of my career based here in Toronto. Um, I'm also joined on the line by Travis O'Rourke and Travis runs our IT recruitment business here in Toronto. He's been with Hayes for five years and he's been in the industry t for ten and he is a real expert when it comes to IT recruitment. So Travis is going to be available at the end to help any, answer any specific or technical questions that I will struggle with. So we're going to have you on the line for about 25 minutes to share the results of the survey and then we'll have a few minutes at the end for questions, it depends on how many questions that we have. If you do have a question, um, as Caitlin mentioned, you can type your question into the chat box as we go along and then we'll answer them all at the end um, or just wait until the end, whatever you're more comfortable with. Um, but we will do our best to try and answer them. Um, just a little bit about the survey before we start. So as, as most of you know, we produce an annual salary guide which shows typical salaries paid out across a selection of industries and functional areas and that's cross-referenced cross for level of experience and the type of company that the role may be found in. Salaries are based on what we see every day just doing our jobs um, and filling the roles that, that, that we get from our clients and also from the candidates that we talk to every day. And it's really become an invaluable reference tool for literally thousands of hiring managers now across the country and we're really, really proud of it, not for just the detail in there, but really for its simplicity and how user-friendly it is and we get a lot of positive feedback about that. If you haven't actually received a copy of the 2015 guide, you can very easily go to hayes.ca and request a copy and we will be in touch. In addition to the guide, we also take the opportunity to survey our clients about their own hiring plans, what they're planning on doing with salary changes, what they're expecting from a, a business activity for the coming year, and how they feel about the economy in general. And this year, the survey was actually completed by approximately 4,000 hiring managers, which is the most we've ever had. Um, hiring managers, HR professionals, business leaders across the country filled in the survey. Um, and they're from a range of industries, obviously. And this year, we've got four years of data to show trends in the job market, and that really puts us into a position to be able to see things happening in the job market that other people can't, and obviously allows us then to be able to provide very valuable advice and recommendations to our clients, which is largely what this webinar is about. So today's webinar, as I said, is specifically about the IT industry. So we've pulled out the responses from 500 hiring managers, HR managers and, and leaders working within the IT sector um, and that's across 14 different industries all across the country. So all of the statistics that we're going to share with you um, in the following slides are based on the respondents from these 500 people specifically from IT. Um, so I'll just give you the headlines first and give you the overview. Um, the IT community's confidence in the economy is at a four-year high. The business activity forecasts remain very high. Hiring plans are pretty consistent with previous years. Niche skill sets specifically are seeing salary increases of almost 10%. Recruitment is evolving and that's causing employers a new set of challenges. And finally, employers may actually hold the cards to addressing Canada's skill shortage themselves and I'll share with you the information about that. Um, so we'll start with just the market outlook um, and talk about confidence levels. Um, so feelings about the economy in general and whether people feel that it would strengthen, weaken or remain the same and for the first time in four years we can see that we've got more people now by a significant margin, it looks like about 12 points or so, believing that the economy will strengthen as opposed to stay, staying, staying the same and we had actually said over the last few years once that happens that that's a very um, positive sign for the Canadian economy. The most encouraging thing to see really there is the movement in confidence over the last three years moving from 30% um, all the way up to 55% believing that things will improve in the coming year. As we know, Canada continues to be really heavily influenced by the US and that's good news which because the, all the news coming from the US is pretty, pretty positive and it feels like it's a robust recovery and consistent. Um, and then we've got other major markets around the world strengthening. Having said that, concerns right now obviously revolve around the price of oil. Our survey was actually conducted when the price of oil was around $60. Um, so maybe things have changed a little bit since then. But I can say that in the markets that we serve across Canada and we're on all of the major cities, we haven't really seen 
any kind of material effect yet. Even this week, um, it's still at the same rate of new jobs being registered and clients interviewing candidates. So we'll see what happens. Um, but that certainly is a, a concern to some degree. Um, how about what companies are saying is happening with business activity levels? So we've got here 70% are expecting business activity levels to increase in 2015, and that matches expectations largely for the last few years. And that's despite the fact that there was actually less people reporting an increase in 2014 than there was in 2013. So is that a blip, um, or is it the start of um, something else or another trend? I suppose only time will tell. But overall, 60% reporting an actual increase in 2014, um, and we've got 70% expecting an increase this year, and that paints a pretty good and positive picture. Then if we look at it regionally, na national average for um, companies expecting an increase in business activity is 71%, and you've got Alberta and Ontario largely matching up with that. And BC actually standing out with 78% of employers, and again, remember this is all just IT, saying that they expect business activity levels to increase in 2015. Um, which is unusual. That, that has not been the case in the past. Usually it's Alberta leading the way, followed by Ontario and BC, this time BC leading the way, and we suspect that's probably to do with the arrival of some large organisations, large technology organisations into Vancouver. We'll come back to that in a minute. Okay, um, so we'll talk about recruitment plans um, for the coming year. We'll compare it with the previous number of years. So we'll just look at permanent headcount plans first, and I'm just going to explain this slide. It's, it's mildly confusing. The shaded lines are what the expectation was for that year, and the solid color lines are what actually happened in that year. And then you can compare the two and see it's what people expected happened did that actually happen. And if you look at 2014, there was less companies seeing the growth in headcount that they had expected. Over 50% over expected to add numbers, and then only 38% actually did. Also, and this is... Um, a sobering thought. A significant number of companies were surprised in a negative way, with 30% reporting a reduction in permanent headcount and only 10% having actually seen it coming. Now, it may not have been the same 10%, but you can see the point. Far more people having a difficult time than expected it. Having said that, uh, we saw almost 40% increase permanent headcount last year, 50% plan on doing likewise this year, and just under 40% planning on maintaining levels as they are for 2015. So overall, a pretty positive picture, and overall, again, pretty consistent with last year. Then if we look at variances, again, by region on hiring plans, BC is feeling the most confident, so in line there with their confidence about business activity levels, and with 54% planning on increasing permanent headcount, and that's followed by 46%, and Alberta by 41% uh, planning on increasing permanent headcount. Um, as I said, that may be uh, pr most likely being influenced um, due to companies like Microsoft and Amazon opening offices um, in the BC area and making waves in the IT market in general and specifically making waves in the IT job market. It's interesting how much of an effect that's having. Um, then if we look at temporary hiring, hiring and really um, this looks like things will remain the same as previous years. Most companies, around 70%, saying that they plan on holding their temporary or contract headcount steady, and 20% planning on accelerating their temporary or contract hiring for 2015. So let's have a look at um, specifically which skills are most in demand in IT. The first point to make here really is that there's a continued and growing demand for experienced people in IT across a range of disciplines industries and locations, as we all know. So it's clearly across the board, IT in Canada is a, what we would classify as a hot job market. Then if you get more specific, key areas of demand would be for things like mobile, web, um, database and software development. The employers are particularly hard pressed to find candidates who've got experience in cloud, in analytics and in security. And all of these really are being driven by developments within the marketplace, which you would expect. Um, Number one, you've got it being driven by the obvious shift in favour of mobile over PC use, which everybody is aware of, but also because of some quite unique happenings in the marketplace. The, the high-profile data leaks that we've seen in the news recently, that's given companies all over the world, or all around the world, every reason um, they need to heighten their own security levels and then avoid really having their own potentially embarrassing emails 
being made public, as we saw with some organizations or specific organizations. We're also seeing IT and marketing, the IT department and the marketing department within an organization starting to overlap. And when you think about marketing now, and we can see this in our own organization, you're really talking about digital marketing. So a marketer in organization is really now becoming a technologist of social media and of um, technical um, channels to produce your advertising and raise your profile, but it's, it really is combining with the, um, with the IT department. The move then by very large organizations, like I said, micro, Microsoft, Facebook, um, Amazon into BC, it's already having um, a catalytic effect on the jobs market and then on salary levels as they start to suck up the available candidates, not just in BC, but we'll start to see that have an effect on available candidates coming out of other provinces as they're drawn towards working for those organizations out west. Um, we all know that when recruitment is difficult, it really revolves around a lack of good candidates um, and also the corresponding rising salaries. But we really wanted to see what else employers are concerned about. So we've asked this question last year too, and now we can compare the results with this year. So after the usual issues of skill shortage salary levels, You've got around, and this is, this is significantly higher, I should say, than the other industries we've got. You've got in excess of 60% of employers thinking about their own employer brand, um, thinking about their own company reputation, and thinking about the resources within their own organization that are available to be able to deal with these challenges. And I should say, when I say company reputation, um, I'm, not, I'm not talking about any negative connotations with an organization's reputation, more so to do with whether the candidate pool is even actually aware of what that company's reputation is. And I think a challenge for employers today is just that of getting your voice heard and getting your message out in front of the right people among so much noise in the marketplace. And it's not just noise about recruitment, it's competing with all of the noise online every day through so many different, um, so many different mediums. Okay, the, the amount of time it takes to fill a role is a good indicator of the pressure that the job market is under. So um, we're going to start tracking this, and this is the first year that we've asked this question. You can see the majority of employers saying that it's taking two to six months to fill a role where there is a candidate shortage, and then they're also saying that the most difficult level of role to fill are senior management roles. Um, with that in mind, it can have, you know, bear in mind the amount of time that it's taking to fill the roles, um, and of specific jobs that are difficult to fill, that can have a knock-on effect in terms of cost, in terms of productivity to a business. Um, you may have to bring in contractors to, to cover, and even then, even if you're doing that, you may have to put projects on hold, um, and that has an effect directly on the success of the business. We asked, what are the main reasons that a new hire doesn't work out? Not surprisingly, the top two were lack of skills match to the role and just a lack of personality fit, so no major surprise there. Um, but it is worth highlighting and, and just stressing this point again that bearing in mind how difficult it can be to find a candidate and how long you spend actually looking to find, get that candidate in the first place and offering him and finally getting him to start, getting that decision right at hiring time is absolutely essential. And we always say to our clients, look, take the time to articulate in as much detail as possible as you can what is it that you're really looking for in a candidate. And then once you've done that, challenge yourself as to really how accurate is this? Are, are the things that you're listing absolute essentials or are they just simply nice to have things? Um, and can you get all stakeholders in the process to agree on what those essential things are in advance of interviewing candidates? And I think too frequently candidates are interviewed and they're hired or not hired based probably too much on gut feeling. Uh, I think gut feeling counts for a lot. Um, but sometimes they are hard just on gut feeling as opposed to any kind of system and usually you get problems there. Um, so once you've got clarity as to what it is that you're looking for, then the challenge of course is the discipline to actually sticking to that. And if the person doesn't have exactly what you wanted, are you able to say no? And a, a phrase that we use frequently um, with our clients is if there's some doubt about the candidate that you're interviewing, there really is no doubt and you've already made the decision and it should be don't hire them. Um, just another interesting point here about social media and recruitment. We did a separate survey last year to look at how companies were evolving their own recruitment strategies and specifically how they're using social media. And the short version of what we found was that most companies see the need to use social media 
and they want to increase their own online profile as an employer, obviously, but the majority of companies are not actually doing that. Um, there's also a, a general sense of reservation or caution as to the risks around having a higher online presence. 77% of people said that they were concerned with how social media um, can have a ne negative impact on people's perceptions of their own brand. And then from a recruitment perspective, 64% are concerned with how social media channels will negatively affect their ability to recruit. So it's an interesting thing. You've got the continued pressure to find specific skill sets, a desire or an understanding about the need to use social media, but then a general sense of fear about how that's going to affect your brand and your, your ability to hire. So it really is a bit of a conundrum for employers. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the skill shortage here as it's something that can and is having a real and quite negative effect on organisations in Canada. So there's been some talk in the, well there's talk in the media every year about the skill shortage but if you think about the conversation that's happened over the last year about the skill shortage, it's interesting and confusing because initially there was agreement that there was a skill shortage then it was tabled that maybe there isn't, um, and it seems like recently the belief that there is again seems to be gathering pace. So it's a confusing thing, but at least that's probably just in the media's minds that it's confusing. Our view here is that there's a clear shortage of highly skilled people in specific areas, like the ones I've just listed. Um, and if you're an employer of IT people in Canada, try, try telling that person that there isn't a shortage of mobile web developers, because there is. Um, and at the same time, and um, on the flip side, there is clearly a challenge to be able to find a job if you're an unskilled person or if you're coming in at an entry level. And both statements are true, and both are very, very different situations. But in, in any event, um, we asked whether Canada suffers from a skill shortage in general. 55% believe that that is true. And then we asked whether your own industry is affected by a skill shortage, and 91% of people in the IT industry believe that to be the case. So it's kind of telling us something that we know. Um, we asked what you think about um, what are the main reasons, and this is interesting, what are the main reasons that are contributing to the skill shortage in your industry? And by far away, the biggest reason, at 47%, was a lack of training and professional development being offered. Um, we then asked what's being done in your organization to address the skill shortage. And only 20% said that they were committing to providing professional development and training within their own organization to their own IT people. Um, then you've got 28% um, that are combining roles and creating hybrid roles as a way of dealing with it. Um, I think the idea of combining roles, that can and could be a very good solution. Um, it certainly creates a more efficient organization if you can have one person doing two people's jobs. But it also creates a lot of pressure on the individual, and we'll, we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, anyway, I think that the, the clear belief that there's not enough training and development in the industry, but only 20% of employers committed to changing this in their own organizations is a noteworthy thing. Right, the, um, the lack of skilled candidates definitely has an effect on organizations, so we know that, but we wanted to find out more about this and find out specifically what effect it was actually having. So one third of employers said that the skill shortage was affecting their own business activity levels or alternatively, another way of putting that, holding them back from growing. But how exactly is it affecting business activity? 38% said that it's affecting productivity directly, and then 20% each citing um, effects on direct effects on revenue and on innovation, which I thought was interesting. And in an industry like IT, innovation is obviously everything, and knowing that employers are saying that the skill shortage is directly affecting their ability to innovate means that it should be and is a real priority to resolve if Canada is to remain a competitive player in the world market. So what effect is the skill shortage having within companies and on existing staff? Well, 35% are saying that it's causing increased stress leaves in the last year, which I thought was an interesting statistic. 40% saying that they're seeing reduced levels of office morale. And then 55%, so the majority of people, citing general inefficiencies in their own organization as a result. So it really is having an effect there, not just on the organization's bottom line, but having an effect on the people who are actually in the organization. The point here is that companies are desperately trying to do more with the same people and the same number of people, 
And while that can be, at times, it can be an attractive business case, it does come with a health warning. You know, your plans to keep up with your own expectations could be impeded, not just by your ability to attract the right people or not, but also potentially by losing some of your own very valuable people as they get burnt out or overworked. So what are um, employers actually doing to respond to this issue? Um, a quick and highly effective fix, and quite a popular one, is the use of contract staff or temporary staff, and that's what 25% of companies are doing. Um, however, when you think about it, like a sustainable business or a more long-term view requires development and promotion of staff internally, and that means having effective succession planning. But we found on the questioning that only 26% of employers actually have a succession plan in place in their organization, as you can see there on the bottom left. Um, another very interesting insight is that employers actually believe that resolving the skills issue is in their own hands. 53% saying that the responsibility for solving the skills issue um, or skill shortage issue is actually theirs, which I thought was extremely interesting. This is the first time that we asked that question. Um, my, my thought would have been that most employers would say, well, this is to do with industry associations, or it's to do with the government, or it's to do with um, schools and universities, but it's insightful that companies would say, well, actually, this is within their own control. So in other words, if, if companies themselves were taking a longer-term view and they were spending time bringing in entry-level people and then providing robust professional training and development, within their own organization, in time, the skills shortage would alleviate. But that's easier said than done. And it's hard for any organization to take a long-term view when you've got short-term pressures to have to deal with. OK, um, on to compensation. So what effect is all of this having on salary levels? So we've got a pretty steady level of employers planning on offering the less than 3% increase, and that's around 55 to 60%, and that's been consistent over the last three years. And altogether, you've got around 40% offering more than 3%. So if you add up the 3 to 6, 6 to 10, 10 plus, it's around 40%. Um, but it's the change within that bracket that's actually quite interesting. So in 2014, we saw more companies offering a 3 to 6% increase than in the previous year which was around, at around 30, 38%, but that dropped then in 20, 2015 with around 32% of employers planning on offering the 3 to 6% increase. So could that be you know, a more conservative approach? But when you actually look into the detail, there's a corresponding increase in the number of companies offering a higher level of salary increase at 6 to 10%. So since 2011, that level of increase is becoming less and less popular and companies being more and more fiscally responsible. Um, but for the first time in five years, we see a sudden an upward movement there from around 3% of employers offering the 6 to 10% up to just under 10%, which is a significant movement. So the majority are maintaining a conservative approach, but perhaps the, the continued skill shortage for the very niche skill sets are causing some niche or high-tech employers to get far more aggressive with salary plans. So then if we look at the provincial breakdown, we've got 52% of employers in Alberta looking at the 3 to 6%, and 37% of employers planning the same change in BC. Ontario comes in at the most conservative, with only 27% planning that level of change, and the majority offering less than 3% or no change at all in Ontario. I should also say here that IT stands out as a universally confident industry in Canada, where the expectation of growth is translating into more aggressive salary increases than when compared with other sectors. So we're doing, and we have we've done surveys, um, we're doing these webinars during the week for finance and accounting, for human resources, for procurement. Um, and in those sectors, there's an expectation of growth in the coming year, and it's very similar, so like 70 something percent expecting business activity to increase in those sectors. Um, but a far more conservative approach to salary increases. Um, I think the continued feeling in IT of there just not being enough good candidates to go around, plus there is confidence in the long-term health of the industry and technology in Canada, and I think both of those points are driving that slightly more aggressive um, approach to salaries. So outside of um, specific skill sets driving growth, how about the level of seniority? So we asked respondents to answer where they were feeling wage pressure. So not just technical um, experiences, but 
um, required their technical skill set, but to do with the level of seniority of the candidate. The area where there's the most pressure um, is at the mid-level senior management, with around 65 to 70 percent of employers saying that they're seeing wage pressure in that bracket. And then at the junior end, not so much at around 30 percent saying there's an issue there. Um, 48 percent said that their company doesn't offer competitive salaries or at the market rate. Um, and 58% saying the number one reason that the candidate turns down the job offer, a job offer, is because the salary is too low in their experience. So just to summarise on this section about compensation, we've got most employers holding steady with a less than 3% salary increase for 2015, 65% of companies saying they're feeling wage pressure at the management level, and around half feeling some sensitivity to the salaries that they're offering to new employees, which is interesting. Okay, on to benefits then for 2015. We asked what was the biggest, what are the biggest influencing um, benefits on recruitment and retention? And vacation tops the charts of benefits, and I'll come back to that in just a moment. But just to focus in here on career progression, you can see there career growth seen as the second most influential benefit, if you can classify career progression as a benefit, comes in at second place. Um, but as I just said, with only 28% of companies having a succession plan in place. Um, so there's a big opportunity there for employers, and we said this last year as well, um, to create a, a succession plan, and it doesn't cost anything. Think of how impactful it would be to be able to show a new hire or a, a, a mid-level person, or actually anybody at any level within an organization, to be able to physically show them the succession plan and to be able to show them where they could fit in and, and say, in five years' time, you could be at this level, um, and to be at that level in five years' time, we need you at this level 12 months from now, and to be at that level 12 months from now, here's what it is that I need you to do. So it's a, it's a great thing to, to create buy-in and um, to show people that you're actually thinking about them and their future in the organization, and it improves their level of motivation and performance. Um, so back to vacation. As I said, their vacation is the most influential benefit on recruitment and retention. Respondents said that they planned on improving, this is an interesting point too, they, they planned on improving flexible work options such as flexible work hours or ability to work from home this year. We said which are the things that you're planning on improving and that came in at the top. But as you can see here, those factors actually rank quite a way down, they're kind of halfway down on the pecking order on how influential they are. So despite the fact that vacation is such a big factor for employers um, or for employees, only 16% of employers are actually giving that consideration to improve. Again, could be a big opportunity for you as an employer to gain a competitive advantage in the market. Another interesting point on here is about paid overtime, and we're obviously referring to um, treatment of permanent members of staff on this one. So in 2013, you can't see this on here, but I can tell you, on, in 2013, only 20% of employers were offering paid overtime to their IT permanent staff. And now, on the same question, that has increased up to one third of employers offering it. And we believe that's quite clearly a response by employers to the competition that working as an independent contractor poses to the challenge of trying to get permanent staff to come and work for you. So with higher hourly rates on offer and the ability to get paid money, more money for every hour that you work as an independent contractor, employers are compelled to compete with this and offering paid overtime is a way of going um, some way to, to achieving that. Okay, so that's pretty much everything. I'm going to leave you with um, just our key findings and recommendations. So we'll start with the key findings. So the confidence in the economy and the optimism for future business activity is at a four-year high. Hiring plans remain consistent with about 50% increasing permanent headcount, which is very, very positive. The skills shortage in specific areas are still clearly present, and that is, it's not going to go away, and our belief is that that is set to accelerate. That's putting increased levels of pressure on existing staff. Um, we're seeing a significant move towards more than 6% salary changes driven by niche areas, niche technical areas and niche skill sets within those areas. Majority, having said that, the majority of employers continue to incre increase salaries by less than 3% annually. And finally, most employers would appear to be taking a short-term view on solving the skill shortage in their business, despite saying that it is their responsibility. Okay, and then recommendations to, to round it out. 
Um, number one, we would say it, it is very important to try and build a talent pipeline for today and tomorrow, more importantly, through a long-term succession plan to meet the business forecasts. Um, hiring temporary and contract staff works brilliantly to alleviate pressure on the current workforce and supports growth plans. It's important to start thinking about your employer brand if you haven't done so. And we're saying there, start selling your employer brand with a well thought out digital recruitment strategy and EVP. So an EVP is your employer value proposition, which is really just a fancy way for saying why someone would come and work for your organization and why would they say stay. Um, essentially, you need to be very clear about what that EVP is and you need to think about how are you going to use digital channels to communicate that message out into the candidate pool. Um, when it comes to salaries, our advice is that you have to be competitive. That doesn't mean that you have to pay the most. It doesn't mean you have to be in the right ballpark, but there's only one organization paying the most, so you don't have to be that guy. But do think about um, salaries beyond just the basic salary and think about performance-related bonuses and incentives. Our feedback is that, co that individual candidates, they will accept some risk um, and take a lower basic salary with the potential to earn more through performance related bonuses, which is an attractive thing for an organization. And then finally, evaluate your existing workforce on their potential. As part of a, a strong succession plan, you know, try and offer training and development and upskill junior to mid levels. Um, you have to do it, and if you do, things will be better in the next couple of years. So, okay, so there are the, um, the key messages that we wanted to share today. Um, Thank you very much for dialing in and listening. I think we largely stayed on time. We were maybe a few minutes over. Um, I hope you found it useful and that you got a couple of um, constructive or productive points from it. Now we've got a couple of minutes to um, spare to see if we have any questions. So we'll just have a look to see have we got anything. Um, but while we're, while we're waiting to do that, um, if you have not got a copy of the salary guide, as I said, you can go to hayes.ca. Um, where you can request a copy. Um, we've also, if somebody usually somebody asks to say, um, can we get slides from the presentation? We we record all of our webinars and we'll post it on YouTube immediately afterwards. So if you go to um, YouTube, the Hayes North America YouTube channel, then you'll be able to find the slides and you can turn off the the audio so you don't have to listen to me talking and you can just look look at the slides yourself. Um, and I think. That is it. If I can help at all with anything, you can email me at rowan.agrady at um, So we'll take a couple of seconds for questions and see if we, see if we have anything. Um, oh yes, and also I think we have Travis O'Rourke on the line in case somebody asks me a technical IT question that I'm incapable of answering. So hopefully Travis is there and that he's been unmuted. Um, okay, so the first question is, um, somebody said, this is probably from a, a HR person, maybe as opposed to IT, saying, how does hiring plans for IT professionals compare against other professionals? Actually, it's far more p positive, far more aggressive. Um, it, there's 10 points higher when it comes to planning and growing permanent headcount um, within IT compared to the national average across other industries. The two areas that we've seen are the hottest for, for a job, the job market or plans to add permanent headcount are information technology and in construction or construction and real estate across the across the country. So if you're an IT professional um, and you know this already because you get lots of calls from companies like us, you're in demand and your salary levels you would expect to continue to increase. Um, okay, another question somebody said with the Sony hacks situation, has this had an impact on recruitment with the Sony? Okay, so this is about, um, this is obviously about the story I was referring to there, so they're saying it. So with the situation where Sony was hacked, released lots of information, is that having an effect on recruitment? And I'm assuming that's to do with um, recruitment for security type positions. Um, Travis, if you are there, do you want to try and answer that? Sure. Am I coming through, Ron? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, I think kind of definitely as we mentioned earlier, it's it's easily one of the most in-demand skills. Now that's not to be confused with a high volume skill. So it's not a skill set that's um, common across Canada or even across North America. And for that reason, it's incredibly in demand. We're seeing uh, an uptick, not just in ethical hacking, but in security analysts 
um, network security specialists, general infrastructure kind of as a whole uh, is going to be a hot sector through 2015. Okay, hopefully hopefully that answers it. If it didn't, you can type your follow-up question. Um, another question here is, why, why, should, um, why are employers concerned about their employer brand and promoting through digital channels? Well, I suppose we can, we can guess at what it is, but when you look at the statistics there, you've got like 60% of companies saying they are, are, are recruiting people or hiring managers saying they are concerned about that. I just think it's because it would appear that the more technologies that get involved in recruitment, the more complicated it becomes. And you think about it as, an, as a small to medium-sized organization trying to create your own digital recruitment strategy, managing the various streams of social media, the different digital channels, um, how do you deal with it? How do you keep up with it? I think you could you could probably deal with it for a period of time, but how do you come up with it? Or how do you maintain that level of effort? So I think it is becoming a challenge. I think I've been in the industry for 20 years, and as each new thing comes along, whether it's job boards, um, whether it's posting of um, somewhere you can go and post your resume, or now with social media, or the next form of social media, or the one after that, um, it just appears to become a more complicated place to operate. So I think it, it does pay off to take your time on that and try and figure out what is your strategy and to put the resource into it. It's, you know, it's not something that, that you can do, that you can't really cut corners on. You do have to invest resource into it. And there's some organizations out there that are doing an amazing job on it, and they do have an advantage when it comes to recruitment. Um, okay, um, another one said, you've mentioned, you mentioned the skill shortage. Um, affecting office morale. Um, are flexible work options a good option to deal with this? Um, so, effective skill shortage or work, okay. So, yeah, I would say so. Um, you know, if we can, you know, if, if you have the ability to be able to offer working from home or um, be able to offer flexible hours, that's a good thing. Um, having said that, like we did see the thing there, I think it was last year, maybe it was 18 months ago at Yahoo where they decided to get rid of working from home options. And I doubt that was a particularly popular thing to do, but ultimately I think their strategy there was that improves collaboration, improves teamwork, and ultimately makes people uh, more successful at work. And I'd be interested to find out, I don't know, but I'd be interested to find out what the result of that was. was that, did that ultimately move towards a net improvement in morale, um, or was it, did people feel Delighted about having it been taken away. So I think there's different ways of looking at that one. Honestly, the way to to affect to affect it is to put the effort into recruiting the right people into those jobs and take the pressure off. I, I think sometimes there's too much um, focus um, put on to, to 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 trying to impress potential candidates and looking after potential candidates almost as opposed to the people you've already hired and looking after them. So you know I think. Um, flexible work option that can help to some degree, but I don't think that that's going to solve the problem completely. Um, okay, um, there's, let's see, I don't have any other questions, so with no more questions, I will let you go. I think we, okay, in total we, stick to, we stuck to the plan, we didn't keep it too long. Um, as I said, you can request your own copy of the, the report, you can go onto YouTube and look at it. Um, and I'd like to thank you very much for joining us. Thank you to everybody who contributed to, to the survey and everybody who responded to it and, and to everybody who actually produced the report and the information on the presentation today. It's very much appreciated. Um, as I said again, if you have any questions, you can just email me directly at my email address there on the screen. So thank you very, very much and best of luck to you for 2015.